Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the privilege that you've given us to just come together and feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, and in our last video we were in chapter 13, and I'd like to sort of zero in on one particular verse, verse 8, which is pretty much where we're at here in our study in Romans. Romans chapter 13, verse 8, which talks about love being the fulfillment of the law. So, y'all just love one another best you can. I uh, wish you the best of luck. Uh, this is Steve. Thanks for watching. Well, you didn't think you'd get off that easy, did you? Um, now, why did, why did I just do that? I did that to make a point, and that point being that love is often looked at as being conditional. You know, that if we just love one another, we'll fulfill the law. That's commonly, most often, how this verse is looked at by the majority of modern Christianity today. Love is the fulfillment of the law, so let's just love one another and we'll fulfill the law. Now, I will admit that on the surface that appears to be what the text is saying, but I assure you it is not. It is not, and I hope in this video, and I, I hope I do somewhat of an adequate job of explaining why that's not the case. My concern is that I won't do that great a job, so I ask you to bear with me here as we look at how we come to walk in the Spirit. We have to begin by understanding how that the fruit of the Spirit operates in the believer's life. I've mentioned this before, that we who are in Christ are dual-natured creatures, not single-natured, which is what we were before we were born by God from above. This sets us apart from the non-believer. Not single-natured, which is what we were before we became a Christian. And this explains why that the non-believer can do nothing but sin. Even the plowing of the wicked is sin. Proverbs 21.4 Sin is the only crop that they produce. Now, personally, I believe they actually till the ground that the enemy sows his seed in. But this video, folks, is not about them. It's about us. Now, in speaking of false prophets, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 and 20, we will know them by their fruits, plural. It's not talking about Christians. It's talking about false prophets. We will know them by their fruits, plural. Why is it plural? Because the grammatical structure of the sentence is, to, is referring to them which is plural. But the grammar changes when we begin looking at the Christian as it relates to fruit bearing and that by our walking in the Spirit. If you look at Matthew 12, 33, it is the tree that bears fruit, and it's the word fruit there is singular. Same with Luke chapter 6, 43 singular fruit in John 15 verses 4 and 16 it's singular fruit and in Ephesians 5 19 
where it speaks of works of the flesh, the word works there is in the plural. Now, these verses are, it's, it's worthy to note the grammatical changes and the grammatical structure of these sentences in the original text. Most of the translations will uh, refer to fruit uh, in these verses. They will show fruit to be in the plural, but I, the original text reveals it to be in the singular. It is the singular fruit of the Spirit. Singular. Now that's that's an important uh, factor to keep in mind as we as we continue on in, in our understanding how that love is the fulfillment of the law. No matter how you look at it, folks, you have to look at good fruit, and I'm talking about in the singular, in the Christian's life. Good fruit equals the sinless new man. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. I just pointed out that the Christian is a dual-natured individual. We have an old man that can do nothing but sin, and we have a new man that can do nothing but righteousness. Now, that just that one fact, that one truth alone, seems to escape the notice of most of modern Christianity, that we are dual-natured individuals, that we, as Christians, unlike the non-believer, are dual-natured individuals. We've been made a new creation in Christ. We've been given a new sinless nature that cannot sin. But God left us with the old man. He didn't eradicate it. He left us with the old man. And therein describes the conflict between the flesh and the spirit. Are you kind of following along with me uh, on this? So good fruit, singular, is basically describing the sinless new man because that's all of it that it can produce. A good tree bears good fruit. Okay? A good tree bears good fruit. The sinless new man who cannot sin does nothing but righteousness. Are you getting that connection there? Christ is the vine. We know that. We are the branches. The branches don't produce anything. The vine does. If you, you cut the branches of a tree away from its root, it, it, it will bear no leaves. The same is true with anything in nature that grows from a root system. Okay? Christ is the root. He's the vine that produces the fruit that we, the branches, bear. We are the branch, the conduit, so to speak. We're not the vine. Christians who live in accordance with the law, who look at law-keeping, the Christian life as law-keeping, the law keeping as a rule of life, who function out of the flesh, who live according to the flesh, who walk according to the flesh, or that it's self, not Christ. When, when the Christian does this, he's, in, in essence, he's trying to be the vine. Folks, we're not the vine, we're the branches. Now, when we come to our this particular passage, we see that love is one of, love is the fulfillment of the law, but when we look at all of the, 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 the nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, that's the singular fruit of the Spirit, not fruits of the Spirit. Because it's, it, it, the reason it's singular is that it's describing a source, that source being the, the Spirit. Love is one of the nine. Love is one of the nine characteristics of the singular fruit of the Spirit. So I posted the following question to Facebook, and which was, are the remaining eight characteristics of the singular fruit of the Spirit dependent upon the one, love, you know, of our, be, our being loving? Now, my purpose for doing that was twofold. 
I felt that the reaction, the feedback that I, I received would assist me in recognizing weak points in my argument so, so that I could create a more explanatory video narrative, which I believe I believe would reduce the possibility of my being misunderstood. Folks, I don't want you to misunderstand me. This is far too important to misunderstand. So allow me to remind you as I often have, and, and I do not ask anyone to agree with me on this or anything else. Study to show yourselves approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The million dollar question that we are faced with here in the eighth verse of chapter 13 is, are the remaining eight characteristics of the singular fruit of the Spirit dependent upon our being loving? Okay? I don't want any of you to go away trying to, to love your neighbor, trying to love another brother or sister in Christ, or, or to look at yourself when you fail to be loving, when you try to love and you can't, or you find that you didn't love, and feel guilt and condemnation and and just and feel like well if I had only loved I would have fulfilled the law folks the text is love is the fulfillment of the law make no mistake about it but the, this text is not telling us that if we do something that God will do something that's law not grace we can't make love a law is what I'm trying to say Okay, so the, the big question here is that we're faced with is are, are the remaining eight characteristics of the singular fruit of the Spirit, there's nine there, of them, are they dependent upon our being loving? And of course the answer has to be an emphatic no. It has to be no. It has to be. There is something much more dynamic at work here, and that's what I hope to bring forth in this video here. So bear with me for a moment, please. Let's, let's just suppose that the text is not saying that we fulfill the law by reserving for ourselves one aspect of the law, that being love, since if, if we make the fulfillment of the law dependent upon our doing something, anything, including our being loving, we have in fact reverted back to law keeping as a rule of life because that's the position I have to take on this. So let's just suppose that that's what the text is saying. Or let's, let's, or let's at least suppose that the analogy of scripture comes to bear uh, in a way that where the, that's what we come to understand on this. That love is not a law. It's not a condition whereby the other the remaining eight characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit are become manifest in our lives. Now, I've pointed this out before, too, on numerous occasions. Uh, when Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born from above, it's the he was using the must of necessity. He wasn't telling Nicodemus he had to do anything. That's, now, that's how it's commonly taken. And, and many of you would disagree with me on that, but I assure you that what the text is saying is that when Jesus said, you must be born again, he was stating a fact. He wasn't telling Nicodemus he had to do anything. The, the word must there is the must of necessity. Okay? He was telling Nicodemus what had to be done. What God had to do in the case of Nicodemus as well as, as, as any one of God's children, born from above, by the will of God, not the will of man, okay? So in the same frame of thought, we're told to walk according to the Spirit, which is not something that we accomplish by means of self-effort. The branch doesn't do that, okay? The branch bears fruit, but it is not the source of that fruit. The vine is. So it's not something we accomplish by means of self-effort, by means of law or law-keeping. 
What it is, is it's the result of God's work in us, not the cause. Therefore, we should realize the importance of sound doctrine. Okay, this is all connected, folks, tied to sound doctrine. There's a reason why we had 11 chapters of marvelous doctrine of grace concerning what God had done for us in, through the, in the finished work of Christ. We sh so we should realize the importance of that, that sound doctrine. What is walking in truth? What is walking in the light? Well, it, it's walking in the truth concerning what God has said is true of us. It's us putting on Christ, clothing ourselves with Christ. In fact, he's, he's actually the armor. I've heard Christians talk about, well, we need to put on the armor of God. Well, what is the armor? It's Christ. What is walking in truth? It's abiding in Christ. What's walking in the light as he himself was in the light? It's walking in the Spirit. Are you, are you following this? So love fulfills the law, but love cannot be viewed as just a law. We can't, we can't separate it from the fruit of the Spirit, believing that it stands apart from all the rest of those characteristics that define the fruit of the Spirit. That's a key point. It's a very important point. Love is one of those characteristics of the singular fruit of the Spirit. It's not, it doesn't set off a, apart from all the rest of it. The singular, folks, is teaching us that if one of those characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, those nine characteristics, if one of those characteristics is present in our lives, they're all there. They're all present. And if just one is missing, None are there. Many Christians don't seem to understand that. They break the, 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 those nine characteristics uh, of the singular fruit of the Spirit down. Uh, they separate them, you know, break them apart, and they look at each one, you know, as something to do. Law. That's, folks, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. There's something much more dynamic at work here. Something much more amazing. Galatians chapter 5, we read, But the fruit of the Spirit is love. It begins with love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, all nine of these things, all nine, including love, against such, there is no law. Okay? You can't make, look at love as being, you know, separate from all the rest, where the, all the rest of the remaining eight are dependent upon the, us doing the one. Are you following this? Sometimes I don't do a very good job of explaining things, and I'm, I've been, for days now, I've been extremely concerned that I would present this in such a way as to where it would not be too confusing. So I'm hoping that you don't you won't find this too confusing. I'm hoping that you'll see how that all this connects. Love is no more a law than any of the rest are a law unto themselves. Verse 25 states the fact that we live by the Spirit. It's an aorist active indicative. It's how we live. It's telling us that this is how we live. It's it's saying that. This is the only thing in which there exists life in the spiritual productive sense. The heiress tense declares it is a one-time action on our part. And that there is no other way that spiritual life is possible. I'm not talking about, you know, being a Christian. I'm talking about maturity, growing in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Verse 16 tells us to walk, that is, that is, conduct our lives by the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit because we only are able to live by the Spirit. To walk by the Spirit is to walk according to the truth which God has revealed concerning us, you know, who we are, and all that God says is true of us in the finished work of Christ. 
We also have to factor into this equation the fact that the law is not made for a righteous man. I just began by, by you know, reminding you of the fact that we have a sinless new creation, a new creation that cannot sin, that we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. The law is not made for a righteous man, and that is what we are. For the mind set on the flesh, that is law, is death. But the mind set on the spirit, grace, is life and peace. Romans 8, 6. We are not under law, yet we see that the, that love fulfills the law, but love can't be viewed as a law. If it were, then all the rest of the characteristics of the singular fruit of the Spirit would be conditional on the one, love, which belongs to the whole singular fruit of the Spirit, that which the Spirit of God, not the flesh or law, produces. Are you following this? So walking in the Spirit is not, as many assume, doing the law. Okay, Living according to the flesh is living according to law. It is the flesh in the believer's life that embraces or adopts law-keeping as a rule of life. Therefore, our walking in the Spirit is not some cause on our part that brings about some result, some positive effect. It is the effect, folks. It is the result of God's work in the believer's life. Walking in the Spirit is the result, not the cause, of our trusting in the finished work of Christ, where that the fruit of the Spirit is then produced by God, the Holy Spirit, in our lives. True doctrine leads us to walk in the Spirit, which results in the fruit of the Spirit instead of the works of the flesh, the works, plural, of the flesh. Plural, as in us, you know, the branch trying to produce the divine. Walking in the Spirit is a way of life. It's a manner of life, a new and different mindset. It isn't something, and no wonder, you know, we were just looking at being renewed in the spirit of our mind. It isn't something that we do. It is the result of our minds being renewed to serve in newness of the spirit rather than oldness of the letter. Hello? Okay. Romans 6, 7, 6. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Take note of Psalms 51.10, which states, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Not the old unrenewed spirit, the right spirit within me. John 17.17, 17, Sanctify them in truth, thy word is truth. 1 John 1, 7, we walk in the light as he himself is in the light. The emphasis there is on light, that is, truth. Ephesians 5, 15, therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, that's, that would be law, that would be flesh, law keeping, but as wise, wise, that's, that's wise is related to, to spirit, Grace, rest, where we rest, he produces. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Them. What is the them that was prepared beforehand? Christ's finished work on our behalf. Ephesians 1, 4, for he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his presence in love, and that is, you know, which we are, okay? The text is not saying he chose us in him before the foundation of the world so that we might be holy and blameless in his presence in love. That's not what the text is saying. 
or that it's not saying for he chose us in him before the foundation of the world so that we could strive to be holy and blameless in his presence. That's not what the text is saying. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, folks, to be holy and blameless in his presence, in love, which is what we are. Ephesians 2.15, by abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and decrees, he did this to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. Colossians 3.10, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Folks, uh, is any of this making sense? 2 Timothy 2 actually sheds some light on this. Nevertheless, God's firm foundation stands bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord must turn away from iniquity. Okay? Now, that we don't turn away from iniquity, iniquity through law. We turn away from iniquity through grace. A large house contains not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay. Some indeed are, are for honorable use, but others are for common use. So if anyone cleanses, cleanses himself of what is unfit, he'll be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, and prepared for every good work. The cleansing of what is unfit is our functioning out of the new man, folks, not the old. Flee from youthful passions, that's that's law keeping, immature, you know, youthful passions, and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Reject foolish and ignorant speculation, for you know that it breeds quarreling. Law again. Law keeping breeds quarreling. And a servant of the Lord must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach and forbearing. He must gently reprove those who oppose him, the opposition resulting from true doctrine, in the hope that God may grant them repentance, that is, a change of mind, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil who has taken them captive to his will. Salvation based on human merit, law. First Peter 4, 8 is interesting. Uh, looking at Young's literal tra uh, translation, which I've, and I don't think I've ever mentioned this before. This is just my belief that Young's literal translation is the closest to the original Greek. Next would be, uh, the New American Standard, followed by the King James Version. That's my position, and I've been working with the original text for many years. First Peter 4, 8, and before, the word is pro, before all things, to one another, and the word is into, it's, the word is ice, into one another. That's, that's, that's important to note. Into one another, having... That's, that's a present active participle. Having the earnest, that is intense, zealous love, because love shall cover, hide, or conceal a multitude of sins. The word conceal there is, is used of a, of, a, of a hut or a cabin, something that you could think of it as a dome, okay? A covering. But the important factor being it, the text literally in 1 Peter 4 it says, it says, having the earnest love. It's something that we have. 1 Peter 4, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. How did he suffer in the flesh? Because he came to do his Father's will, not his own, folks. Hello? He came... And he set aside all that. He suffered in the flesh in the sense that he lived a life in full dependence upon the Father, not self. Hello? Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, dependence upon God, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. 
so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Folks, I submit to you that if you have come to trust God concerning the abundance of marvelous doctrinal truth that the Holy Spirit has infused into your lives, you are walking according to the Spirit and not the flesh. That walking in the Spirit is not something one does in order to walk in the Spirit. Uh, imagine somebody saying, well, well, you know, we need to walk in the Spirit so that we can, you know, well, walk in the Spirit. You know, that would be like me saying I need to breathe in order to be alive. I mean, I, I've got to keep breathing here, you know, if I, if I want to stay alive. Folks, I don't breathe in order to be alive. I breathe because I'm alive. My breathing is evidence of the fact that I'm alive. Just as, as breathing is a natural result of my being alive physically, walking in the Spirit is the natural result of God's work in our lives spiritually. The fruit of the Spirit includes love and is the result, not the cause of spiritual growth. So what about the old man who does nothing but sin? We need to realize that the sinful old man is what embraces law-keeping as a rule of life, but that the flesh profits nothing, and that the law is not made for a righteous man, which is what we are in the new man. That path, folks, it only leads to frustration, failure, and defeat. Yet the Spirit uses that disillusionment to bring defeat, or that he prepares the heart for victory and growth in the Lord Jesus Christ. We find nothing but failure depending on self, which God allows to make us more miserable and needy. The Holy Spirit is increasing our realization of our need for Christ, faithfully carrying out his mission of glorifying our Lord Jesus Christ, speaking not of himself, but remaining hidden. Folks, he hasn't even revealed his name. John 16, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not, she shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and, show, and shall show it unto you. Just about everything modern Christianity believes, folks, is, seems to be backwards from the truth. That's just the time that we're living in. Not only does obedience not bring blessings, obey doesn't, the word obey doesn't even mean do. It mean, the word is hupakuo. It means, it's the, the word here is a kuo. The word obey is hupakuo. It's the intense form of hearing. It means to hear intently, to be under the intense hearing of another. That's what the word obey means which is a result of our being blessed already it is it is when we are weak that we are strong the way up being down 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 folks into death the death of the cross whereby I have been crucified to the world and I will take that as the world religious system and the world unto me Modern Christianity elevates man and pushes down God. It's almost like it, modern Christianity assumes the opposite view of everything that the Word says. Man is sovereign, not God. Righteousness is something that we earn we, or we strive toward, not something that we are. Even the emphasis is on our being faithful our being faithful rather than the faithfulness of God. Man isn't spiritually dead. There, there was some residual goodness in him that made himself alive. In modern Christianity, goats become sheep and, and tear miraculously transforms itself into wheat and a dead man resurrects himself to life. Christians fret over saving lost souls when Christ redeemed his people and he will find every one of his sheep who have gone astray. We just got to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to his people so that his people will hear and they will hear. But it's important what we pro what we preach. It's important what we proclaim. We, the gospel is not our proclaiming what man must do, but what God did. 
That's the truth, folks. That's the truth. He will find every one of his sheep who have gone astray. And scripture has nothing to say to the non-believer except judgment. It is a love letter to God's people. Modern Christianity has put the cart before the horse when it comes to just about everything. But we can rest and trust God that he's, he knows what he's doing. And it, but it is because man takes himself so seriously, which has always been his greatest sin. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thank you for watching.